In this very plain presentation, I'm going to talk about the main issues in translation theory that students should know before they enter the field. Um, you will see it's not a very wide field, um, and there's a lot of intersection with other fields, and the, the main issues tend to be repeated throughout the discussion. So, first of all, we have a, um, a classification of translation studies um, into pure and applied branches, um, and these are very much separate. We have a um, university uh, acad academic discipline of translation studies, which is kind of uh, fighting to maintain its independence from linguistics or from, from language departments. And um, they, they're, they study the applied field, but they often um, they don't work in the, the field because in, working in academia is a different job than translating, although there are exceptions. Um, so a lot of times what people will learn in university focuses very much on the pure field, um, on, the, on the like functional translation theory, on the what they have now, maybe post postmodern translation theory, and not so much on the the practical issue of translation. Um, for me, it's different because I've worked as a translator most of my life, and I you know, I didn't study it until having been in the profession a couple of years. Um, Here's again a, a tree of the, the applied field. Um, there are some voices arguing that uh, because it's a practical, translation is mostly a practical activity, although it's been expanded into this whole uh, cultural framework, uh, that it should join again with, uh, with linguistics, that it should, it should become a part of language learning again, because it was for a long time time considered part of language learning and then kind of separated for various reasons. Um, in the applied field, what, what's interesting for, for translators to look at is, uh, first of all, the, the, the tools that we use. Um, you, you should know about the, the major um, the CAT tools and the, uh, the word you should know advanced word processing and a little bit of desktop publishing um, you should be really internet savvy because i still see especially in the older generation or even people still entering the uh, um, profession right now they are not what you would consider a digital native so you really have to be up to the task you should be able to work in any modern uh, agency environment as a translator. Um, the thing with traditional translation theory is until very recently most of the text published was some sort of literature and only like in the last let's say 30-40 years did translation become a major thing uh, well, tra tra translating has always been important in international business, but it's it's not been such an important business process as since the 1980s. And uh, a lot of the theory has shifted since then because we're not working with books anymore. The, uh, when you study translation theory, they're talking about books. They start talking about the only book that was available, the Bible. And then they continue talking about novels when they came up in the, I don't know, 18th, 19th century, um, but um, you see, looking at the product that you translate is not really that helpful. You should first of all see it as a service, it's or a process as it's treated, and um, also in, in the industry standards. And it's like very much nowadays a form follows function approach. So. Um, the translation, whatever turns out in the end, you know, you can take a text and translate that into a, a movie, yeah, like like a director does, and that's kind of um, what is going to be happening on the smaller level too for translators. That you get a different input format and then pr turn it into something completely else. What's the the main 
the main issue here is you want to meet the customer's expectations. So when they give you specifications, they want something from you, you have to give it to them. That's the whole deal about translation right now. Um, so text, text is the definition of a text is changing or for interpreting, you know, of a, um, speeches, not so much maybe, but uh, translation is turning really into a, um, into a transforming activity. Um, so you it really don't, a lot of the old theories or still a lot of translation theor theory looks at the word level, did they use the right word to translate that, is it accurate, and accuracy really is not such a big deal because you are producing something for the target market and it's a new product or like it's it's a new text so you have to make sure that what you put out makes sense internally your output has to make sense and whether it's really in line with the input that's a matter of debate still has been for for the last couple of thousand years um so what you're going to get a lot of times when you're starting translation th theories is the initial definition of a text so uh you, there are written let's say there are written or other products that are not a text even you know what i mean they're writing but they don't make sense for example because texts they have to be coherent they have to they have to have cohesion you know one once uh, um, one information has to follow from the previous uh, se sentences, um, there has to be an intention. It has to be acceptable for the audience. Um, and it has to make it has to make not just sense internally, but it has to make sense in this information in the situation, and it has to convey some sort of information. And um, texts are always not always, but they should they usually conform to a type of genre even if you have uh experimental literature it's still a form of literature it's fiction writing so there are other texts that are around, surrounded there's a culture surrounding it um i like to phrase it as a text is something that somebody will pay us to put into another language you know if it doesn't make sense if it's just incoherent rambling why would you want to reproduce it like think of uh, I don't know, lorem ipsum text, you know, when you see a website design and there's like just placeholder text on it, um, that, is not, that is not a text. That is just, uh, those are just letters, words. Um, and uh, since people pay us to translate it, they're not paying us to create the text, they're, they're paying us to convey the meaning more or less, they want the text to have a function. They want the text maybe to tell people to do something, to achieve certain behaviors in their audience. And that is our job. That is our job to make the people do what our clients want them to do, basically. Um, the one Another classic in translation theory are the translation strategies. Um, proposed by Vinay and Dar Darbenet. They were like a couple of French theorists. Um, and those I find very interesting. It pays to take a closer look at those and maybe really understand them. Um, they look at the various levels, like word level. You have different, uh, you have like uh, borrowed words, which are like, for example, in German, you call a computer a computer, although there is like a Germanized word for it. There are, um, which would be the calc. Uh, we, in German, we call it a rechner, which basically is just German for computer. Um, or you have a literal, you, you have like literal equivalence, which doesn't always work. When you say, let's build up the tent, uh, it could mean, yeah, let's build the tent, yes. But um, for example, phrasal verbs are very difficult. You, can, uh, um, you can't translate them one for one into German. Um, and then you have uh, different ways in which to translate um, uh, phrases. So you can uh, um, you can just rephrase it, right? You can transpose it. You can modulate it, which means you you can actually change the perspective. And this is something you really have to 
do in translation and which is not done enough because many texts they have um they should be written from one coherent perspective maybe from the writer's perspective but then they start switching around which is just a fault of the source text so it could make sense to actually change everything to the writer's perspective or change everything to the reader's perspective and um this is something you should think about this uh, is quite a lot of rework um then equivalence exists when you translate an idiom with an idiom like you, in, in england you or in, in english you call it an elephant in a china shop in germany it's a bull in a china shop and it says the, the same thing like creating a huge mess right wherever you go um then another thing you could do is adapt it which is one famous example uh, from nida another theorist who was a bible translator was that um I think he really didn't do it, but somebody said he did, or he criticized it, uh, that he was translating the Bible for the Inuits, and they didn't know what the Lamb was, so they, instead of calling it the Lamb of God, he called the seal the seal of God. Um, other techniques which are very important, which I use a lot, is uh, economy. Um, for example, you cut out conjunctions that are not necessary. You place... Um, you, you reorder words to save conjunctions, to reduce commas, um, to make the sentence flow better. You put the subject in the initial position to make it sound more like actual English. Or one case that was studied by Mona Baker, I think, is that you put the, that op, introduce an optional that. You, you, can say, you can say, for example, in English, the man I saw or the man that I saw. And in um, in this study, um, which I think was from the early 90s, they found out that um, the translators are more likely to explicitate. Um, so they added the that. They made it more obvious. Um, well, false false friends are also a way of translating. And uh, of course, that's what you learn in every language class to not use them. Um, yeah, and again, explicitation, or you generalize. Generalization is a good way of risk management. Um, for example, you, you're talking about, the, um, you read a text and it says, our offices are located in the heart of Berlin. And actually, if you know Berlin, you say, you know there is no heart because Berlin has no single downtown. It could be Alexanderplatz or Zoo or whatever. So then um, you could generalize, you could say our, offices are in the middle of Berlin or they're right in Berlin and that way you're avoiding risk by generalizing and you're not saying anything wrong right you don't want to do that then um, yeah the an, another thing I would like to add is personification because many languages tend to say for example um, in the text it is written because they do not want to personify the, uh, the text says they don't want to use a um, an animate verb with an inanimate object which in english is it is okay to do but um many if in german you would normally say in dem text steht geschrieben you wouldn't say the text sagt um, and this is a technique you can use to great effect when translating it to English, for example. Um, so you don't just need, uh, this is where, where translation skill comes into play. I wouldn't, like I would say that uh, translating skill is pretty much writing skill. If you're good at rephrasing things, of under, extracting the meaning, and rephrasing something in one language and then you speak another language well, you're going to have an easy time translating. Um, I, I want to mention some examples of Calx that we talked about earlier because what's really interesting, German has uh, had a big Germanization movement and uh, started maybe. It started maybe with Luther or maybe earlier that they just 
took all these words that were Latin or Greek initially, and they invented German uh, calcs for them um, to make the language more easy for Germans or to make it more internally coherent. But this strategy can also have some drawbacks. For example, that's something you do not do a lot in German, in English, sorry. Um, you see Abstand is a Germanized word for distance. Augenblick is a German word for moment. Moment. Um, Entwurf, project. And these are like artificial words. Zeugemutter for nature. Jungfernzwinger for a cloister. And uh, these, some of these like Zeugemutter, they, they didn't really make it. They're not being used anymore or they never were used. But like something like Grundlage, Fundament, or even Hochschule for university. These are or Völkisch for National. These are all Germanized uh, versions of words that used to be in Latin. And English doesn't do that. For example, you think about distance as distance in English. Is there a, um, there might be an Anglo-Saxon word for it, but it's uh, the the Latin one is going to be used. Moment is moment, project is project, nature is nature, foundation is foundation, university is university. So some some countries, interestingly, they tend to do that. For example, modern Turkish has done that because the, the old Ottoman Turkish was full of loan words. Um, and uh, one interesting quote, what I found very interesting, um, was I, I dare you to guess who said this. And um, I'm going to translate it really quick. If there is anything that is not Turkish, that is not true to our race, then it is this throwing around of old German expressions that don't fit into our time and that don't really mean anything specific, but they lead to a movement being perceived only as a language movement, really. And this is real nonsense um, that you can see a lot nowadays. This quote is actually by Adolf Hitler. So he was opposed to a linguistic Germanization, at least, and he actually banned, there, there was a prescriptive language association. Um, he banned them for criticizing the Nazi language too much because they actually liked to use foreign words so people wouldn't understand them. And also they thought if we're going to become world power, might be other for the subdued nations to learn German if we have more loan words. Interesting fact. Um, and uh, also a lot of the German, um, a lot of the German grammar, interestingly, was introduced from Latin through translation. So not just words, but even grammatical structures. Um, the old, the older German, uh, what they spoke in, like the. Charles the Great's times, I don't know, Old High German or what it was, it had different tenses or it didn't have a lot of the Latin tenses that so that were introduced now. And now nowadays we have our, our German grammar studies are is very much based on the, the categories from Latin, all the names that we use for the tenses and whatever. And those were actually imposed on the language. So those can enter a language too. And now the same is happening through the influence from English that um, the grammar is changing through translation. Um, so now, before we talked about text, right? What is a text? And now we, um, there was a, um, um, a scholar called Paul Grice. And he set up a, a couple of maxims for communication. And this is pretty much what all common sense business communication courses are going to teach you, right? Uh, I used to work for a company. The guy, he always, the, the boss, he always used to say, just make sure it's not embarrassing. Hauptsache nicht peinlich. That pretty much summed it up for me. You know, just make sure it makes sense. And if it doesn't make sense, don't even say it. Um, and uh, the, the First of all, the, you have to include all the necessary information, but not include too much information, right? Like writing business emails. Hey, do you have the papers? Okay, send them over. That's it, right? Truth, yeah, so don't make assumptions, especially in copywriting. You know, when you say, we have the best product, how often do you, do you read that? 
how can you know it's the best product? Do you know every product in the world? No. So these kind of things, if you say them, they just make you sound foolish if your customers really think about it. Um, so keep, tone it down. You're going to have a lot of text to translate that, that make these kind of false or, uh, you know, these statements that are neither true or false, you know. Um, then it has to be relevant. So that the relevance really depends on the receiver. If the audience doesn't understand your product, um, it's not gonna it's not gonna resonate with them. The, the it has to be clear. You have to speak in clear language. You know, for one big difference between academia and the business world is in business people don't get paid to read your crap so you want you want to sell something you want something from them in academia people get paid to to read through your musings you know you can express yourselves in funny ways and they, they, your professors be uh, will be like okay i get paid for this so i'm going to be patient this is not going to happen in, in business so yeah, you have to be clear uh, avoid ambiguity and actually a lot of the grammatical structures in English are just based on a lot of the strange rules that we have are just to avoid ambiguity, to make uh, to make clear that uh, we're meaning one thing and not something else. Um, yeah, these are these are really things to think of. And this these these maxims, what's important about them, they have to apply to your target. To your translation so whether or not the source text observes all these maxims you want to make sure that you get them right when, when you're writing um, a related concept are the text functions uh, for which were set up by Katharina Reis she was a, a German translation scholar and um, the, the, the text functions are actually based on older an older model, I think, by Karl Bühler, and then she added a category by uh, Jakobson, Roman, I think was his name, Roman Jack Jakobson, who was a big linguist. And uh, the, the way you, you're taught in translation studies is actually that these are separate functions. You have a text that is informative, or it's expressive, or it's appellative, like like a call to action that wants people to do something, or phatic doesn't have a, a linguistic function, just a social function. Um, but these are not really separable, you know, and they're like, um, yeah, you can imagine it like a triangle. Um, for example, you have a report that's somewhere bef between informative and operative is it expressive some people might be expressive report writers you know that they put a lot of emotion into their reports is it really appropriate you don't know so if you're translating a report that maybe is overly expressive you might want to tone it down on the target you have an ex electoral speech i would say would be pretty much more on the expressive side, of course, because there you want to you want to get maybe you don't even it's not operative you don't really want people to do anything but you want to move something in them it's kind of yeah a little bit like like a poem like fiction the thing to keep in mind is you you have to classify every text that you work with and make sure it fits somewhere in that. It is going to be somewhere on that matrix, and FATIC is not included here. So a lot of the writing and, and copywriting, for example, our dear valued customers, uh, welcome to our page. These are FATIC. Um, this is FATIC information or, or FATIC communication. Um, so you have to think about wh whether it is relevant for your target audience, because of course these FATIC uh, expressions they vary strongly across different cultures um, and here I want to show once again for example that these different text types they can really they can cover various fields so a report can be informative and a narrative like a story can also be informed it can include information maybe the information is more important than the way it's told even right think about like oral 
oral history. Um, so it's not clearly separable. Um, also, one thing I want to point out is uh, copywriting, transcreation. A lot of people think that copywriting is expressive. Copywriting, like advertising, is where does this belong? Is it an expressive text? Is it informative? It's appellative, phatic. You know, one clever thing I heard is all writing is copywriting. If you're writing an instruction manual, that's going to be advertising for a company. If you're writing your website, that's going to be advertising. The GDPR, even if nobody ever reads it, that's going to show how your company is. You know, everything says something about your company or says something about your readers. So first of all, remember that all writing in business is copywriting and that all copywriting should be informative. It should give the people what they want. And normally they want to know why they should buy your product. Um, <clears throat> so one uh, good strategy I want to suggest, one practical strategy, are internationalisms. Um, they are usually abstractions, like in the fields of politics and science, like old words from Latin and Greek. Or there are concrete products like uh, coffee, chocolate, tea, chai, which are pretty much the same in all languages, you can imagine. Um, then you have uh, words like system, international problem, republic, which in the Western world are almost universal, universally understood in all languages. Then you have like Arabic root words like siyasat, mushkilat, istiklal, huriyat, Kitab, these are the same from uh, from North Africa to India. People will, will understand these words. Um, and uh, when translating, my languages are German and English. And uh, although it might sound a little translated, if you use the Latin words, in, uh, for example, in IT writing, it really depends on what, what fields you're writing in. But if you're writing for, let's say, for software, it makes more sense to use the Latin words because it's easier to understand. And nowadays you have to think that in Germany, most a, a lot of people living here, their, German is not their first language, so they will have a much easier time understanding loan words than uh, calcs. Um, so it, they're a good tool to bridge language distance. And this is also why, because English as a lingua franca international, um, they don't bother they don't bother uh, anglicizing most of the words because English is used by so many different people. Uh, just one example is like display. There is a German word for it. You don't have to use it. Or a connector. You know, nowadays we say connector instead. Before it maybe it was stecker. That is really changing. Um, in law, maybe not so much. Then in law, it's, it tends to be very archaic language. Also in English, you have these words where you think, what, the, you, you don't, nobody understands them anymore. Um, and here, just to show that how easy it is to identify a text type, right? This, uh, okay, these are German uh, examples. Um, you see the uh, you, you can see right away the Aussichten für morgen. You know the weather for tomorrow, and right away you know it's a weather report. Or uh, like slowly, slowly fry the chopped onions. You know it's a recipe. If um, there is one phrase that's often used in the Bible, I think only in the Luther version, es begab sich also zu der Zeit, which is like a signal word. It means he's introducing a story. Um, so everybody will know right away what kind of text you're dealing with. Um, or I'd, probably in love songs all, all over the world, if you have a text with a lot of you and I and love, it's probably a love song and uh, probably a cheesy one too, like uh, folk music or, uh, or country music or something like that. So it's very easy to recognize. And by following these patterns, you know, du und ich, ich und du, wahre Liebe immer zu, you know, right away, this could be a, uh, this is the, the lyric for a, a country song and you can follow this pattern and just make up your own.
Um, I'm going to skip descriptive translation. Let's look at functional theories. Um, functional theories, they came up in Germany in the around 1970s, um, around the translation centers of Heidelberg. And they're very much related from translation sh to the translation uh, shifting away from literature and towards a uh, um, t towards like a, a business process, I would say, although they don't use that word because business is a bad word in academia, but um, they so they they maybe it came from the rec the realization that they're not dealing with texts in the uh, in the traditional sense anymore so you have one piece of information and you have to find a functionally adequate equivalent in the target so it has to be adequate on the on the textual level and not just on the the word level and it can take a totally different shape. Form follows function, right? <clears throat> and it comprises like several theories that are related very much to particular names. I think translation studies has a big problem with name dropping. It's just about dropping names of people so they can sell their books or whatever, like in all of academia. And I think just if, if you, uh, if you uh, like, uh, excuse my digression, but I think it's very much related to why to the demise of the or the shift to that all smart people that are inventing stuff, they're going into business, they're working for Google, and they're not working in academia anymore. I have to say, I don't know how it is for wider linguistics, but that's how it is in translation, I guess. Um, and maybe. Maybe I'm exaggerating a bit, but uh, yeah, all this name dropping and self-referential repetition of, of the same concepts over and over uh, is not very helpful for for the field. Um, so uh, translation is treated as an act. It's it's not just a uh, it's not just a language learning activity, um, and uh, they are there's a purpose you want to achieve something with it that's really important so the a, a good translation is not a translation that sounds like the original or that's really faithful no it's a, a translation that achieves the purpose and this is definition has strongly influenced the current industry standard the ISO 17100 standard so um They've picked it up because uh, even in the translation world today, in the business, there's a lot of discussion. Is this a good translation? Is this accurate? La, 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 la. So if you look at the functional level, it, um, it really helps. You're, you're moving away from the uh, functional theories are said to dethrone the source text because in the old, old days, every text had an author. A really you know probably a really smart person and you didn't touch anything that they said nowadays we're dealing with authorless texts you don't really know who wrote what you're working with right um then the like the the most the well-known most well-known uh, functional theory is uh, scopos theory which i think pff, if you want a name, uh, if you want looking for a catchy name, it's not such a smart choice. Um, Scopas is like Greek for how could you can translate it in various ways into English purpose. Let's say purpose theory. So um, yeah, basically means it sums up the whole development of the functional theories that the uh, the purpose is uh, dominates the translation. Um, and one important thing is that the meaning of a text is not in the text. The meaning of a text is how the, the recipient receives the text. So if I say something to you and you're insulted, even if I didn't mean to insult you, what matters is that I insulted you, right? And that's pretty much the same with translation. So the translator is really a mediator. He has to find out was what is the he has to think for the customer you know um 
and that's basically my, my number one argument. I don't have discussions about my translation quality that much, but like if there was, you could, the, the, the smartest thing to say first is, hey, your customers, you know, this is going to help you get more customers. Your customers are going to understand it. They're going to ask you less questions. You're going to save money on customer service or whatever. Um, so it's more important that the text makes sense. The, the target text has to make sense. And uh, it, it could be totally different. It can take a totally different shape, uh, which is what now we, uh, we're calling trans creation in the industry. So uh, creative uh, translating or uh, translating uh, copywriting translation. Um, another important uh, development from the Scopus theory, which is, um, or from functional theory which we deal with a lot in the um in business is the translation brief they, they call it a brief in english in german it's called an auftrag and auftrag is also hard to uh translate but it's in, in iso they call the project specifications basically what it means I'm not going to talk about the piece of paper. It means the customer has to tell you what they want. The quality is meeting customers' expectations. If you don't know the expectations, you can't meet them. So it kind of places the responsibility on the buyer side. And I mean, the translator does have some responsibility in talking to the customer, to the client, and finding out their expectations. You know. For example, I recently worked with a web design agency and they were pretty good. I, I knew they were good because why they asked me all the questions that I didn't even know I had because they knew their job. And this is what you're supposed to do the translator. You're supposed to, somebody sends you a text and says, hey, I need this translator. Then you're going to say, hey, wait a minute. What about this? What about that? What is your audience? What, by when do you need it? What format? La, la, la. And this is basically how you, how you come up with this translation brief. Um, and this is separate from the purchase order, um, Bestellung or uh, PO in English. Um, the PO is just, hey, we're giving you the job and uh, maybe tells you the deadline, but that's it. And you can find uh, templates for translation briefs online, good ones. Um, however, although we have this translation brief, although uh, ISO 17100 um, states that you need process specifications. Um, the translation quality concepts, the, the QA assessment concepts that are used by agencies, maybe not so much anymore, but just until a couple of years ago, they were very much based on formal finding formal errors or stylistic errors or to, to have a softer term. Um, and, and not so much on a, on, on a translation brief or on like uh, on, an adequacy. Um, and now I've, I found a really good study from, I want to drop her name here because she's not one of the big scholars, but her name is uh, Milorova Shiflet. I forgot the first name though. And she, she wrote a, a really nice paper on uh, equivalence in legal translation because that's a big thing you have um let me just follow her explanation like the um you have varying degrees of equivalence or non-equivalence so you can have like something like a civil union eingetragene partnerschaft and the civil union has uh, probably entered the german law from international law so just like human dignity which entered german law from the UN declaration of human rights so these are actual equivalents, probably even because the German was translated into German from the original. You, so you can use these te you can use these terms in translation. Then you have annual bonus, which depending on the context, if it's just for an employee, you could call it like a variable pay, like variable proportion of the salary variable. Uh, you could call it, or in German, you, we call it a bonus nowadays, but a bonus would be maybe something more for the managers. Um, so an annual bonus, and this is also like a really Anglo, 
American thing, right? Having a not having a fixed salary, but having a bonus. So these are equivalents. You can use them across languages. Then you have partial equivalents, which means um, there may be like some, some degree of uh, lexical equivalents, but not legal equivalents. And that's what I call dic the problem with dictionary translation. If you go in a dictionary and you enter, let's say, um, you enter Geschäftsführer, manager, factor, business executive, chief executive, general manager, they don't even list director, or it could be director, right? The problem is, um, Geschäftsführer will probably have a definition somewhere in the German law, so you can translate it as not simply as director, depending on the context. You might want to add like a director under German company law because the German corporate structure is different than the American structure. Um, then murder, for example. Yes, murder is a lexical equivalent, but the law, you're not going to be sentenced for the same law in Germany as in the US for murder. So um, you might want, you might, depending on the context, want to explicate it and add an explanation as defined in section 201 of the STDB, of the German Criminal Code to you because you want to reduce ambiguity right going back to the crisis communication maxims um then the the last uh, difficult um issue is a, a non-equivalence but at the legal level um in english for example you have in america you have a plea bargain that means kind of you you say you're you're guilty and then the the state prosecutor he gives you the how do you call it the government or government attorney oh, they, they, he gives you a lower sentence um you can translate it, this into german as aufschuldig plädieren yes but there is no plea bargain in germany so the, the um, it had there here there is linguistic equivalence but there is no legal equivalence uh and a tricky term is sozialhilfe which in uh, germany um doesn't exist anymore because now we can't call it unemployment benefits to um used to be called like social assistance um and you cannot translate that as, as social security when you're writing for america for the wider english-speaking world yes social security in the you know, i don't know in the u.n charter somewhere it is defined as like social assistance but in America, Social Security is um, is a minimum, what we call in Germany, um, Grundsicherung. This is what you get when you're old and you can't take care of yourself. And this ensures a social minimum for people that are out of the working um, population. And Sozialhilfe in Germany is for unemployed people or long-term unemployed people. So there is no linguistic and no legal equivalence. And you, and you really have to know your stuff when you're translating these kind of things, or at least be realistic about your abilities and know when you're when you have to do the research. Um, for example, let me give you a, a German Hartz IV abschaffen. How would you translate that? Um, uh, Hartz IV uh, is like kind of the equivalent of welfare in Germany. So can you just translate that as abolish welfare? Uh, 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 no, not really, because Hartz IV abschaffen is what people say who who want they want more benefits, not less. So this is something you think about, right? When you have these terms, you can't just translate it as abolish welfare. It doesn't work. No, you, you could actually a functional translation would be more welfare. <laughs> more welfare payments, but it's it's the total modulation of what the source actually said, right? But it preserves the meaning. Um, 
Yeah, then there's a newer school that I'm going to talk about really quick. Um, Berman's Negative Analytic, and this is related, then expanded by uh, Benuti, who is a literary translator, American one. And they're talking about like things, things not to do in the uh, things not to do in translation, your um, or things that you, or strategies that you use in translation. But they're kind of adding a value judgment, and they are relating it very much to the source text. And this is often criticized as a return to literalism, to strict literalism. And <laughs> Well, it might make sense in, in fiction writing because those are tend to be higher higher value texts. Um, but it doesn't really have much applicability for the for the business world. Um, for example, that you rationalize, you make the text more readable. You're explaining content. You're expanding. You're improving the author's style. You're um, you're hiding taboos, you're reformulating them to not injure the target audience's feelings. And uh, this, the related foreignization approach is all about preserving the cultural quirks of the source text. Yes, maybe it's cute for people who want to read about, uh, who want to know about whatever German culture and they want to know it literally. But when you're trying to sell something, I suggest that something you don't do. This is really out of place in, in copywriting. There, it's really about adaptation. Maybe you're going to really rebrand the whole product and, and invent something new. Um, so, again, as I said, there's a big split between theory and practice and also between literary and, um, and commercial translation which some people are questioning, but it's around issues like these where it um, revolves. Um, we've had also a cultural turn, like in all of the social sciences, where I don't, I'm not sure if translation should be considered a social science, I guess. Um, we've had a cultural turn. Translation is more than language. You're translating culture, right? And here's one example, interesting example, actually. These are like two German rappers. And you know, rappers, what they do, they translate American culture into all over the world. And uh, the young people like it, old people don't like it. Um, and uh, what, what I found really interesting, um, this guy, Kollega, Kollega and Farid Bang, and they won an award. Uh, and they had they have been making their music their you know very vulgar obscene music for the last 10 10 15 years and they were initially they were like the all rappers do they glorify violence against women and and drugs and violence in general but they were doing it in an American way. They were glorifying American violence, guns. We don't have a gun problem in Germany. They were glorifying or they were portraying stereotypes of, of evil immigrants, immigrant violence. This is not a scandal. Somebody like stereo, uh, playing a stereotype, not, not a scandal in Germany. But when they, uh, when they so as long as they were just translating the American culture into the German culture, there, there was not such a big uh, discussion about them. Then what happened actually when they won that award because they were selling a lot of records, I guess they were never really critically acclaimed. But then they ended up selling so many records that they won this industry award. And then it turned out they were actually talk. They were glorifying German violence too. They were making jokes about Holocaust victims, right, in their in, the, in their music. So that is actually when the when the the public turned on them. That when it became a scandal. So while they were talking about something foreign, it became a scandal. It, it, it was not a scandal when they talked about German violence. When they glorified something that we have here, then it became. A, a touchy issue and I guess that might be similar to how rap music was in the in the early 80s because it was like the um, 
when they started to uh, with gangster rap and started glorifying the you know the uh, as american as apple pie violence when they started glorifying that then it it, it kind of hit home it, it was a big discussion and they and they introduced that parental advisory sticker and all that um so yeah this is something to think about and maybe this is an interesting case study for the foreignization debate because while they were foreignizing the violence they were saying this is not your violence this is maybe even imposed upon you by evil imperialistic forces um they were not criticized for it and then when they talked about and and then when they they, they talked about a german issue then it became a scandal um and another very interesting fact actually is uh like i i am uh, i go to turkey once in a while i look at the news and this guy here kollega the the boss i guess of this duo and he translated um he, he's a, he's a translator actually the guy he's he's uh i think he grew up bilingual too so i i guess that's where his uh his uh his uh, musical talent comes from and um he translated for a uh, um he translated the words of a turkish creationist the guy is called atman oktar and he he's kind of a mixture of a ottoman sultan and hugh hefner he has like this playboy mansion he's sort of a pimp a religious pimp and he translated his works into german which i found was very interesting so the guy has a very broad broad cultural framework you know maybe not like high culture but he's the guy he's uh, he has very wide influences um so this is also a case of translation not relevant for commercial translation practice probably but maybe a case to look at for translation studies um so from from the holocaust glorification let's turn to uh, one example that i found uh, this is just word level equivalence but it, anyway there's such a big context attached to these words that it makes sense to look at um the you know article one of the german constitution it means it says in german die würde des menschen ist unantastbar human dignity shall be inviolable that's how it's translated and this is actually the they took this from the U, un declaration of human rights all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights and to be honest with you i don't know what they mean by würde in german i never figured out what this dignity is supposed to mean what do they mean the word does not express it this, this is a metaphor and i think not a very clever one um I looked it up a little bit, and there's like a website by the um, like federal agency for uh, political education, and they said this concept it goes back to die Würde des Menschen unantastbar. It goes back to Kant, his philosophy, uh, and they have it in simple German so that I can understand it. It says. Um, Things are valuable if we can eat them, but humans are not things, so we shouldn't judge people by their value. So, uh, so actually, um, a proper, a good translation of this would be like, uh, we must not judge people, or all people are valuable. All people have value. You know, you're not allowed or we must not question human val a a human's value we are not allowed to question their their value or their dignity it's just something we don't think because you know like nazis or other systems they said like oh if somebody's not useful uh, we we can just kill them right so the government they can say oh these guys are bad they're not useful so just uh, they have no value for us and so this is what this article is supposed to mean so the tra translating this word for word the human dignity shall be inviolable mm, kind of tricky right or and also the just uh, a pet peeve if you do legal translations this uh, um uh, this use of shall 
um, you know, because you don't know if it means it must not be viable, uh, it, it must not, uh, it, it shall be, it must not be violated or it will not be violated. What does it actually mean? Um, so that's one, uh, one example, you know, where literal translation, it, it really leads to confusion. And in my opinion, because the source text is not is pretty ambiguous, you know, dignity is a pretty big word, you know, tell us exactly what you mean. Um, then another interesting case study I want to look at in translation is, uh, uh, um, I, I forgot to write down the quote, but it's actually uh, the, the ex exact uh, Bible citation but in the king james version it says and adam knew his wife and she conceived right he knew his wife because that's what in hebrew it said some it, like to know to know your wife is to get like intimate or how, how they say it in french to unite unite with in haitian creole interestingly interestingly because it's a newer language they say adam slept with his wife right um Martin Luther, he always also stayed literal. He said, I can't design wife. He recognized his wife. Um, Romanian, conos, conoscuto, that probably means something like he got to know her a little better. Um, in Italian, then all the Romance languages, they follow the French, unite. Italian, si uni, unite, se unio. Arabic, Russian, I can't uh, read. And then, interestingly, the New International Version of the Bible, the English version of the Bible, uh, which is used pretty widely, actually, they say he made love to his wife. And making love to somebody, this is initially referred to flirting and didn't come, into, come up in the language. Like this concept didn't even exist until the... Uh, 16th century in English, and even in the in the early uh, in the first half of the 20th century, it was still <laughs> it was still used for flirting. It wasn't actually used for intercourse. So interesting choice. So maybe they they want to. Uh, um, it's a pretty liberal use of the word love, but I mean, I guess that's probably the message of this book. Um, so I'm almost over. Just one, uh, a couple of questions to think of, like as I've mentioned before. Um, for most of the text that you'll be working with, is there a single author or is there a single intention? So or who, whom do you dethrone when there is no author and there is no source text? You know, the... the um, there, the, the text might have might be a multi-purpose text, or um, and, and you very rarely you're going to know who it was written by, and you're not going to be able to contact them in most cases. Then uh, Mona Baker, she introduced. That's where I found this uh, the maxims by Paul Grice. She, she uh, said that sincerity, brevity, and relevance are maxim specific to the English culture and first of all I would like to ask is it always like this and uh, like was it always specific to English was old English when you read like George Orwell for example read his uh, politics and the English language and do you think that it's really although he says as one of the maxims you're supposed to write briefly but compared to contemporary writing is it actually is it actually uh, uh, is it actually concise by today's standards? So has our standard of what, um, of how we what we expect from a text changed? And is this also happening in other languages through language contact through the internet? That texts are just becoming shorter because we don't read anymore. We skim, right? That's what you read on all the how to write your website copy. People skim; they don't read. Um, then can a translation brief, I think that's one intention of the translation brief in the uh, ISO standard. Uh, can, uh, they want to make it, they want to make it possible for several people to work on the text, but um, can it really replace experience? 
or you know can can instructions actually replace the experience working for one client on the same types of texts because that's the thing that actually makes you better and not detailed instructions what do you think and um is it more important to know your subject or is it more impor important to know your client because a lot of uh in germany especially you know we're country of experts so all the all the translators they claim to be big experts in their fields they know everything you know or should you know your client should you know what your client wants might, might be what, some, worth thinking about especially in your own in your own freelancer business communication and um yeah another question that i asked before was is cultural it's a cultural turn in translation studies which i didn't talk about that much is it the attempt of cultural studies to conquer translation studies as uh, one author expressed it so and uh, what uh, can we do about it or is that really relevant is cultural studies relevant to us okay that was all for now thanks very much if you listened and um, if you have any comments, just leave them below.